Namaskar. I would like to thank the organizers at Miranda House and Ramanujan College for the opportunity to contribute to this faculty development program in life sciences. So today I have decided to speak on the topic of plant biotic interactions and adaptations. So I'm going to share uh, the slide. Okay, I hope that you can see the see these slides. So um, I am going to talk to you about plant biotic interactions and adaptations as conundrums in sustainability of commercial transgenic crops for pest, virus, and weed resistance. So I've just divided my talk into three parts uh, or three sections, if you like, and I will be starting with uh, the section on pest resistance. Okay, so this slide sort of takes you back to the early 1990s uh, when there was a lot of effort going on in the scientific world, in the community to try and develop uh, transgenic plants uh, which are resistant to insects. There were many candidate transgenes uh, such as uh, delta endotoxin genes from Bacillus thuringiensis, plant proteinase inhibitor genes, chitinase genes, lectin genes as putative uh, transgenes that could be used to make crops that were resistant to various uh, debilitating yield loss causing pests. So in this particular race to try and get the best possible transgene, there were two major uh, groups of uh, genes which were strong candidates. So one, of course, was uh, delta endotoxin genes from Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacterium, and plant proteinase inhibitor genes. So most of the work that I have done uh, as a PhD student and as a postdoc, and now my students and I do, uh, involves plant proteinase inhibitor genes, which are actually uh, defense genes present in uh, most plants. And these uh, plant protease inhibited genes, or PI genes as they are called, uh, are induced as part of the jasmonic acid cascade. And the ingestion of these proteins by uh, the pests uh, causes uh, disruption in normal digestive processes and kind of delays the growth and development of some of the susceptible target insects. The reason why uh, we do not have plant proteinase inhibited genes as transgenes in commercial uh, transgenic crops is because uh, of the work uh, that was initially done in a few labs around the world where it was shown that ingestion of plant protease inhibited genes uh, causes an adaptive response in the targeted uh, insect where the caterpillars or the larvae, as they are called, produce uh, enzymes or proteases, which are not inhibited by these plant protease inhibitors. Uh, and uh, this is a very complex molecular uh, response involving a large uh, expanded gene family of serine proteases, usually in the case of lepidopteran insects. So this uh, work on the molecular basis of adaptation of lepidopteran pests to plant protease inhibitors uh, was part of the work that I had done with Dr. Roxanne Broadway at Cornell University, and it is published. And uh, this was part of a large body of literature that has shown that insects adapt to plant protease inhibitors. So as a result of that, you don't see any commercial transgenic plants these days, which have plant protease inhibitor genes. Instead, what you see since the early 1990s is the development of Bt crops, Bt crops which have delta endotoxin genes. So I am going to talk in this particular section on Bt facts and nonfiction. So as an introduction, Bacillus thuringiensis or Bt is a soil bacterium. Uh, under stressful conditions, stressful environment, the bacterium produces insecticidal parasporal crystals, as you can see in the electron micrograph shown at the bottom there, where, um, let's see if I can see this here, where you can see a crystal 
which is formed uh, in this particular sporulating uh, bacteria. So uh, powders of Bt uh, actually are major biopesticides or microbial pesticides that are available commercially also. And they actually constitute at least 1% of the agrochemical market. So these uh, powder formulations of uh, Bt are major components of integrated pest management or IPM programs around the world. And these Bt powders have been used as sprays to control agriculture and urban pests since a long time, like 1911. So what is the mode of action of Bt? Uh, so the crystal inclusions in uh, the cells of Bacillus thuringiensis are actually protoxins. So they have a propeptide at the N-terminal end, uh, N-terminal uh, region, and the uh, upon ingestion by the uh, larvae uh, of say Lepidopteran uh, pests, the insect uh, gut proteases like trypsins and chymotrypsins, mostly trypsin cleave this propeptide. And this cleavage of the propeptide activates the bacillus uh, thuringiensis uh, endotoxin. It, by the way, it's called an endotoxin because it is efficacious or it is activated inside the insect upon ingestion. So uh, these uh, Bt endotoxins where the propeptide part is removed, uh, a small region is removed are known as delta endotoxins. So actually these delta endotoxins bind to brush border membrane vesicles, which line the peritrophic membrane uh, of uh, the larvae, uh, Lepidopteran larvae, and uh, this causes leakage of the gut contents, ionic imbalance and septicemia, and the insect essentially dies uh, from uh, uh, ingestion of delta endotoxins. So the crystal structure of insecticidal delta endotoxins from Bt has been resolved uh, some time back. And uh, we know that the structure of the delta endotoxin has three domains. There is domain one, which is made up of alpha helices. And this is the part that contributes to the transmembrane part of the protein and is uh, involved in formation of the pores once the uh, protein actually binds to the receptor. So the receptor uh, binding region is actually found in domain two, which is comprised of beta sheets. Uh, in this particular uh, diagram, uh, the red uh, color shows the second domain. And this particular binding to the receptor resembles antigen antibody binding uh, domains. So uh, if uh, one wants to talk about the specificity uh, of uh, various delta endotoxins to bind or not bind uh, to particular uh, cognate receptors on the peritrophic membrane, one should look at the sequence that encodes the domain two. So in this uh, cartoon, you also see domain three uh, in green color, which sort of looks like a jelly roll. Uh, this protects the carboxy terminus of the protein from proteolytic cleavage. Uh, this slide shows you some uh, crystals of Bt endotoxin, and it also so shows you some scientists in Africa uh, doing some bioprospecting to find new strains of Bt uh, with uh, probably new uh, kinds of endotoxins which are efficacious uh, to different extents uh, against various uh, targeted pests. This slide also shows you a very simple cartoon of the mechanism of toxin action. First of all, the crystal or the spore is eaten by the insect. Okay, uh, and this uh, cartoon shows the larvae of a uh, Lepidopteran pest, uh, which has a highly alkaline uh, gut pH. So in this particular environment, the crystal dissolves and the protoxin is processed into the smaller delta active form of, by the gut enzymes like trypsin and chymotrypsin. So the, in the third uh, step, the activated toxin binds to the receptor. So remember, the receptor is very important, and there are many uh, receptors that have been identified. In this particular cartoon, you see uh, uh, N-aminopeptidase, but other examples of receptors are cadherins, 
which we shall talk about in a little bit. So once the receptor binds to the uh, to the ingested uh, delta endotoxin, there is a conformational change, and the toxin inserts into the membrane and makes it permeable to ions and other constituents uh, and small molecules which are there in the gut, uh, and then the cell busts and there is septicemia. So uh, this particular slide shows you different types and examples of uh, Bt endotoxin. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are the slide tells you that there are many kinds of Bt endotoxins which are specific for different kinds of insects, whether they are uh, dipterans uh, or coleopterans, that is brucids and beetles, or lepidopterans, which is what we have been talking about, that is the group of moths and butterflies. So there is Bacillus thuringiensis variety Kurstaki, also known as Dipel, uh, as a brand name, uh, which is also uh, extremely efficacious and has been used very widely to control a large number of agricultural uh, insect pests uh, in India as well. There is also Bacillus thuringiensis variety Israelensis, uh, which is available as Vitobac. Uh, which is uh, specific for dipteran uh, pests, including urban pests like mosquitoes. So there's also Bacillus thuringiensis variety tenebrionis, which is specific for coleopteran storage pests like, uh, uh, you know, like various brucids and vivils and so on and so forth. So there is different uh, efficiency of different isolates of Bt, and they exhibit different lethal dose 50. Uh, in their uh, effect when fed or applied to different crops, which in turn are eaten by different pests. So as I mentioned before, there's a lot of bioprospecting which goes on for uh, looking for more efficacious, diverse spectrum of Bt strains, uh, which is uh, an activity that is still going on worldwide. Another interesting aspect when we talk about Bt powders is that with the advent of recombinant DNA technologies, uh, multiple toxins have been developed uh, using uh, genetic modification of the bacteria, such as the uh, brand name Raven, uh, where uh, chimeric uh, Bt genes have been created and they have been used to make uh, sprays. So what is the advantage of having such genetically modified uh, powder formulations of Bt? The advantage is the very sought after trait of delayed resistance. Delayed resistance meaning delaying the resistance in the targeted pest to the pesticide that has been applied, in this case, Bt powder. So this is a slide that shows you uh, some pictures. Uh, you can see uh, the application of Bt powders uh, using an aeroplane uh, in the US by hand in China. Uh, you can see this uh, seed uh, distributor in Andhra Pradesh uh, who is selling Bt powder. Uh, and interestingly, uh, you can see that uh, Bt formulations are actually used pretty uh, extensively by organic farmers because uh, it is a biopesticide and safe, considered safe for the environment. In fact, you can actually buy uh, Bt as a uh, liquid biopesticide on Amazon and it costs about 600 rupees. All right, so the Bt uh, delta endotoxin protein is obviously encoded by genes, uh, and uh, they are encoded by multi-copy uh, cry genes, which are found on uh, plasmids. And these cry genes, uh, standing for crystals, make the crystal or the cry protein, which is the uh, main uh, insecticidal uh, protein in this particular technology. So depending upon sequence similarity, there are many groups of cry genes. Uh, in this slide, you see examples of cry1a, cry1b, c, so on and so forth. The one to remember or appreciate is cry1ac, which has been used to make the first generation of Bt cotton, which is also uh, which was also used in India. 
Uh, there is also cry 2 a b c which is efficacious against both lepidopteran and dipteran pests uh, you may like to remember cry 2 a b which has been used for uh, making the second generation uh, of uh, bt cotton there are other cry 3 cry 4 and so on and so forth and as i mentioned earlier uh, sometimes chimeric uh, genes where you have some domains from one cry, one group, and other domains from other cry uh, gene groups, which have been used to make constructs uh, that have been used to transform crop plants, at least for lab uh, experiments. So when you, uh, as faculty, and if you're teaching uh, in a college and you are interacting with your students, so some of the good discussion points that uh, might be of use is to talk about what are the crops uh, that are actually sold uh, commercially as BT crops. So these include BT corn, BT potato, BT cotton only in India, BT soybean. So uh, the incorporation of genes, cry genes, uh, encoding these uh, BT endotoxins in the genome of plants to make transgenic crops is more advantageous over the use of the powders, which are ephemeral and do not last very long in the environment because they are usually very susceptible to UV and can also be washed off. So it's better to have it as a transgene uh, in the uh, genome of the uh, crop plant. Uh, another uh, phenomena, if you like, or now it's very common, uh, which is to be appreciated is that when you incorporate a bacterial gene uh, in the genetic background of a crop plant, you may have to optimize its codon so that more GC-rich codons are present uh, in the uh, cry gene. Uh, and this improves the likelihood of good expression of the transgene uh, in the transgenic crop. So uh, very often this codon optimization is actually done by the uh, synthesis of these genes uh, chemically. So th there are many advantages of BT crops. Uh, the most uh, important one is that less uh, insecticides are used when uh, BT uh, crops are grown. And that is uh, probably without uh, any controversy. The, there are also many disadvantages, even in the first generation of BT crops, uh, some of which from the point of view of a scientist is that the antibiotic resistance gene, which is uh, used for in the process of making a transgenic crop is still retained. Then there is uncontrolled insertion into plant genomes, though now it's getting better with more targeted insertions. Uh, there's of course the likelihood of horizontal gene transfer uh, in a center of origin of the cropland, uh, which may pose a threat to varietal biodiversity. Then, of course, BT seeds cost a lot of money, but perhaps the most important disadvantage, uh, especially in countries like China and India, is that the concept of a refugia, which is essential for the sustainability of uh, BT crops, is really impractical. So uh, what is refugia? Uh, refugia is essentially a concept uh, by which the development of resistance in the targeted pest can be delayed. Uh, and this can be delayed by having a certain uh, area or proportion of the field uh, growing susceptible uh, crop that is susceptible to the targeted pest, okay? Uh, in, in a field where the rest of the area is under uh, uh, cultivation of the BT crop. So the concept of refugia uh, is beautifully explained by the work of uh, Professor Fred Gould uh, and Professor Bruce Tabashnik, uh, who I talk about in a little, little bit in a little bit uh, from now. Then, of course, uh, one can have a more uh, general discussion, more extended discussion about the pros and cons of BT when uh, the matter is uh, discussed uh, with the students. So uh, currently, there is the second and third generations of uh, BT crops. 
uh, which are under development, which have been deployed. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, they, they give us a lot of food for discussion and a lot of food for thought, uh, especially from the point of view of sustainability and the conundrums of sustainability, as we shall see in the next few slides. Uh, and then, of course, when you talk about BT crops, one should, of course, talk about those countries where it is legal to grow BT crops. So that uh, the recommendations that come with the growth of BT crops, like uh, enforcing a refugia, recommending a refugia, uh, becomes uh, part of the uh, necessary steps to ensure the, the, the uh, efficacy of these transgenic crops, which uh, definitely are part of the repertoire of varieties uh, that are available to uh, uh, to control pests uh, using less insecticides. So this is a slide with pretty pictures. Uh, you see uh, larvae of Helicoverpa armagera, which still remains the bane of uh, many uh, of many farmers who grow different crops. This is a highly polyphagous uh, caterpillar which feeds on families uh, of crop plants belonging to very diverse taxonomic uh, groups. Uh, you also see here the uh, fruit uh, shoot uh, borer, the eggplant borer, uh, and its caterpillar uh, against which uh, BT uh, against which transgenic crops were developed, uh, but have not been deployed. So these are some of the uh, pests uh, against which uh, BT uh, crops have been developed in India. Okay, so uh, I have been talking about BT crops from uh, uh, around 2003. Let's say talk about BT cotton, uh, whose uh, which which was actually introduced into the Indian agro uh, ecosystems in around 2003, following government uh, permission to grow them. Uh, so this particular slide shows you a publication that came from 2015. So uh, after a span of uh, several years, where the group of Bruce Tabashnik uh, and his uh, co-workers uh, very uh, clearly uh, talked about uh, the effect of uh, BT crops containing Cry1AC, which is the first generation BT crop, on the pink bulbum that is Pectinophora gossypiella. Uh, so while these insects in the United States remained susceptible to uh, the transgene, and the BT endotoxin that it produces, the uh, insect populations in India were shown to be highly resistant or became highly resistant to Cry1AC. So uh, as shown in this abstract, there was this paper talks about field evolved practical resistance to BT cotton, which produces Cry1AC in India. So one of the ways in dealing with insects which developed resistance to uh, Cry1AC, which is the uh, endotoxin in the first generation uh, BT cotton, like Bolgard, uh, was, was to use a second uh, Cry endotoxin, and that is Cry2AB, to pyramid into the background of the uh, Bolgard uh, and obtain uh, the second generation of Bolgard, which has two cry toxins, cry1ac and cry2ab. So uh, we will spend the next few slides uh, taking a look at what this uh, very beautiful paper talks about in trying to understand what is happening to the insects which are out in the field uh, and feeding on uh, transgenic uh, Bt cotton, uh, first generation bulgur. So uh, this is a very interesting paper, and let's just have a look at what this paper has to say. So in this particular paper, what the authors did is they had susceptible strains, uh, aphis, uh, of the uh, insect, and they also had uh, pink bulbum 
which they called AZPR and is and BT4R, which were reared on artificial diets containing purified BT endotoxins, that is cry1AC. So what they did is they also did diets which contain not just cry1AC but also cry2AB in order to see uh, if insect populations can be obtained which are resistant to both the uh, ingested BT endotoxins, that is cry1AC and cry2AB. So this is a table from the same paper where you can see that uh, these strains, which were called BT4R2, uh, in the 15th generation of feeding on diets which contained Cry2AB, uh, developed substantial resistance to the insecticidal effect of Cry2AB. And 85.7% of the insects that were uh, investigated were resistant to Cry2AB. Uh, the red box in this slide shows Cry1AC results, uh, that is results of uh, insects which fed on Cry1AC. So you can see here that uh, these insects uh, were uh, also resistant, that is 56.5% of these insects in the 15th generation, that is filial generation F15, uh, uh, showed uh, substantial resistance to Cry1AC. So there were insects in BT4R2 strain which were resistant to both Cry2AB and Cry1AC. So this is a beautiful paper by the group of Dr. Raj Bhatnagar at ICGEB in uh, New Delhi, uh, where they showed uh, where they collected insects from uh, BT cotton fields in uh, in Maharashtra and Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh, and they tested the ability of these insects to survive on, uh, on, uh, on BT cotton, especially containing Cry1AC. So the test that they do uh, is that they take uh, the brush border membrane vesicle preparations, and these are uh, incubated uh, with uh, various uh, uh, various uh, brush border membrane vesicles from the gut of uh, these uh, larvae from these different fields and their ability to bind to the delta endotoxin is evaluated, okay? So uh, what they showed was that uh, in this particular figure, you can see that the uh, control strain, the lab selected strain uh, was highly susceptible, remained highly susceptible to Cry1AC, but that insects collected from different regions uh, showed lower binding of the brush border membrane vesicles to the delta endotoxin of Cry1AC, suggesting that the insects had become resistant. So this is a very nice paper with a nice abstract, and I'm going to read to you these particular uh, lines from the abstract. So it says, considering that cotton is the only host crop on which pink ballworm multiplies, and with 11 million acres of BT cotton and very little conventional cotton available, that is uh, the refugia, the monophagous insect species, that is the pink ballworm, which feeds only on cotton, by the way, it is under evolutionary pressure to adapt to BT cotton for the species to survive, survive and to sustain. Given the fact that India is considered to be the area of origin of P. gossypiella, multiple adaptive mechanisms involving several Cry1AC resistance alleles from a large mutant pool could be rapidly combining to evolve BT resistant populations. Interestingly, the resistance development in, uh, the, uh, in uh, Pectinophora gossypiella could be faster than that of other polyphagous ballworms, which may be feeding on other uh, crops and not just focusing on cotton. India is not the only country which reported uh, resistance uh, in pink uh, ballworm uh, to uh, the BT uh, cotton containing Cry1AC. So it was in 2012, uh, around 2010, 2012, that there was a paper uh, and various reports which also talked about field evolved resistance to BT cotton in China. 
you can see in the graph below where from 2007 into 2010, uh, the populations, the number of populations that survive on Bt cotton with Cry1AC uh, transgene is increasing. Okay, so what is responsible for uh, the development of insect populations? Uh, the Pectinophora gossypiella uh, populations which are resistant to Cry1AC. So the culprit is calcium dependent adhesion molecules or cadherins. So cadherins uh, are receptors of the Cry1AC uh, and these are transmembrane glyc glycoproteins which are about 700 to 750 amino acids long. They are evolutionarily ancient and are widely expressed. So they are associated with, uh, mem with members of the plant cytoskeleton, uh, insect cytoskeleton like actins and catenins, and they are found in invertebrates and vertebrates. So this is a cartoon from uh, the book Molecular Cell Biology. And this is another cartoon which tells you that cadherins play a role in the uh, attachment of uh, cells to their neighboring cells. And uh, these are important constituents uh, of uh, the, the connections that exist between different cells. This is another cartoon which shows you, uh, uh, which shows you actin uh, filaments, which are associated with cytoskeletal accessory proteins. Uh, these in turn, are uh, associated with e cadherins which are uh, which form connections in the extracellular space between two adjoining plasma membranes in the gut of the insects okay so uh, this is a paper another very nice paper which talks about the molecular mechanism that is associated with field evolved resistance uh, of pink ballworm to bt cotton in india this is also work done uh, by various uh, groups, uh, including that of Bruce Tabashnik, where, all, where uh, the scientists report alternative splicing and the production of highly variable cadherin transcripts uh, in insects which are feeding on Bt cotton in the field. Uh, the authors actually report that uh, if you look at just eight, eight insects, uh, collected randomly from the fields in India, uh, they were able to see 19 unique variations in the genes encoding cadherins, as compared to uh, a large number of insects screened in labs in the US where only four mutations were observed. So these uh, genes, uh, the cadherin genes, are uh, highly prone to a process known as alternative splicing which enables a single DNA sequence to produce many variants of a protein. So these are some pictures from this paper. Uh, on the left, you can see the map of India with the sites from which sampling of insects was done. And the cadherin genes were sequenced and examined uh, in these insects, which were resistant to the insecticidal effects of Cryvanac transgenic Bt cotton. Uh, so the sequence analysis showed that uh, the results are sort of summarized on the right, where you can see the wild type uh, protein, which is encoded on the top, and the different kinds of mutant alleles that were observed, uh, which produce uh, truncated or non-functional cadherin molecules. This is a slide which shows the introns and exons, uh, which comprise the wild type cadherin gene. And it shows you the various insertions, deletions, uh, frame shift mutations, and stop codons that are seen in the mutant alleles uh, in insects which are resistant to the insecticidal effect of Bt cotton containing cryvanac. Okay. So uh, if one looks at cry to a b now we already know by, as, as we just looked at these papers, that the uh, uh, pectinophora gossypiella, uh, pink ballworm 
populations were resistant, became resistant to uh, Bt cotton, uh, which uh, is the first generation Bt cotton with Cry1AC. So uh, the idea was uh, to incorporate or pyramid Cry2AB. Now, the work in the lab uh, that we were talking about in the papers showed that, yes, BT4R2 uh, is uh, resistant to Cry2AB and Cry1AC. So uh, if uh, one wanted to find out what was the mode of resistance in uh, these insects to Cry2AB, one would do what are called uh, sort of uh, crossing over, uh, crossing experiments, where you would take one parent, uh, which is BT4R2, and you would cross it with APHIS, which is the susceptible uh, parent, and you would follow the genetics of the progeny with respect to susceptibility uh, to uh, the uh, Cry2AB toxin. So what results showed was that the resistance to Cry2AB did develop and that it was autosomal recessive. That is what is shown in the graph here. You can see the susceptible parent APHIS shown in brown line here. And you can see the resistant parent that is BT4R2. So the F1 generation obtained by crossing APHIS with BT4R2 uh, whether uh, it was the male parent being APHIS or the female parent being APHIS, you see that the F1, the F1 resembles APHIS S. So it is a recessive trait, resistance that is. So this slide shows you that the uh, resistance to Cry2AB uh, is autosomal uh, recessive. So on the top in A, you see results, that is the number or the percentage of insects surviving on control diets, which do not call, con contain any uh, endotoxin, and on try to AB diets. You can see that no insect survives, uh, that is insects belonging to APHIS, the susceptible uh, strain. Uh, none of them survive on try to AB, but they all survive on the control diet. In contrast, if you take the BT4R2, you see that they both, uh, that the insects feeding on control diet, as well as the insects feeding on Cry2AB survive because they are resistant. So in C and D, uh, you take a male BT4R2 and you cross it with the female APHIS, or you take a female BT4R2 and you cross it with a male. And you can see that the resu results resemble A, that is the results with APHIS, okay. So that's how you say that the genetics of resistance is autosomal recessive. So uh, one would also like to know, is the resistance a, or in the case of uh, these insects feeding on Cry2AB also similar? In other words, are cadherins also mutated forms of cadherins also involved in the resistance in the case of Cry2AB? So this paper doesn't go into the molecular uh, mechanism, but it just shows that the locus in the insect genome that is involved in the uh, resistance phenotype is probably different. And you can see that that the uh, you can see that from the uh, ratios of expected to observed uh, number of uh, surviving insects. In the case of uh, populations feeding on Cry2AB diets or cry one ac diet. A very elegant experiment that is talked about in this paper is also about how to prove. So all of this result is from lab-fed, uh, artificial diet-fed insects. So uh, in this paper, results were also substantiated when uh, Bt cotton balls were actually taken. Uh, and uh, with both Cry1AC and containing Cry1AC, Cry2AB uh, uh, as transgenic products, and similar results were obtained. So the bottom line was that uh, the pink bulbworm, Pectinophora gossypiella, uh, being monophagous on cotton, having a center of origin in India, develops resistance to uh, Bt cotton. 
uh, and uh, especially to Cry 1 AC, that is the first generation BT cotton which became famous or infamous, as you would like to call it, to Bolgard. Okay, uh, they also in the lab show resistance within 15 to 16 generations to Cry 2 AB. So if a pyramiding effort was done, which was done, and Bolgard 2 is out in the field, you would see a resistance, which has been sort of reported, uh, but uh, we do not really know uh, how substantial it is or what the molecular mechanism is, at least in the public domain. It does show that uh, while uh, these BT uh, cotton does confer some advantage, uh, and it is a pretty important uh, advantage in lowering the amount of insecticide sprays. There is also a propensity for at least one of the target uh, pests, that is pink bollworm, to develop resistance to the transgene. So what is the solution? What is, uh, what is the conundrum? What is the way out of the conundrum? How does one address the sustainability issues? Uh, if, if, if you think of it from the point of view of more transgenic products uh, to replace, augment uh, what is already existing, that is already there with the uh, proposal for making Bolgat 2, uh, also known in some cases uh, very dramatically as Bahubali 2, Bahubali 1, Bahubali 2, to try and develop uh, cotton, transgenic cotton, containing CRY1 uh, and CRY2 uh, proteins to kind of bolster the uh, effect, even though we know that there is going to be resistance that develops in some populations. What is already uh, available in the pipeline uh, is the next generation of BT crops, and that is Bolgard 3. Uh, which is being advertised, uh, especially uh, for application in Australia, is uh, a version of uh, BT cotton, which contains three transgenes targeting different, very serious pests like Spodoptera, Exigua, Heliothes, Viricens, and of course, Pectinophora gossypiella. So these uh, third generation BT cotton would contain Cry1AC, Cry2AB, and VIP3A as transgenes. So there would be a pyramiding effect. What Volgard 3 also contains is resistance, genes conferring resistance to herbicides like glyphosate, glufosinate, and also now dicamba. So uh, it would be an insect and pest resistant uh, BT cotton, uh, uh, transgenic cotton, if you like, uh, with wider application making, supposedly making the life of the farmer easier. However, as uh, this talk is about conundrums in sustainability, we will see in the third section when we talk about herbicide tolerance and about the development of resistance in particular weeds to these herbicides. As I had mentioned, there are additional readings and these readings will be uh, there at the end of the third section. Thank you.